We won the fight against the no-deal Brexit before. Now we must do it again. During these unprecedented times, we've had to get creative and take our advocacy online. But we won't stop fighting for our values. We have until June to fix this. Help us save our economy and save our NHS. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, No to No Deal rally. Uh, we're just having a few technical problems here with our uh, combat who just had to log out, but we're just going to go straight into our first speaker. So will you please join me in welcoming Hill Williams, uh, Brexit spokesperson for Black Primary. Greetings from Wales. Plaid Cymru campaigned for our continuing membership of the European Union. For myself, uh, I've always seen myself as being European and Welsh. We are determined to make the best of this extremely damaging situation. And that means getting the best deal that we can. And that means that we must have more time. Our priority in Wales is for an agreement. An agreement that allows our farmers, our manufacturers and our, our hauliers to continue trading within the single market with the least amount of friction possible. Under the government's approach, they face huge disruption in January. Today is Boris Johnson's chance to allow flexibility and compromise. And with the Welsh economy facing the deepest recession in centuries, it is vital that we avoid any pointless disruption. The talks have barely progressed since March and huge gaps remain on the level playing field provisions, on governance and of course on the intractable problem of the border in Ireland. Yes, there is no sign of agreement and no sign of agreement either on fisheries. Clearly, we need more time. I tabled a motion calling for an extension to the transition period on the 13th of March. And that's uh, when the support of a wide range of sensible MPs who all agreed that ideology should be put aside in order to deal with the pandemic. But instead of doing the sensible thing, the UK government are doubling down, determined to force a quick rupture, and that's regardless of the consequences. They seem to hope that the disruption caused by the pandemic will hide the huge problems if we crash out without a trade deal. I fear that they also see this crisis as an opportunity. An opportunity to chart a radically different course for the recovery, free, of course, of the EU's silly rules on workers' rights and the rules on environmental standards. Boris Johnson seems to care nothing that this would be a breach of the clear promises he made in the deal he agreed just uh, six months ago with the European Union. Indeed, the disaster capitalists are now really in charge, aren't they? They're gambling that the shocks caused by COVID-19 and an old trade deal will allow them to forge a radically different political and economic system. And their friends, of course, will be hedging billions of pounds on a crash out Brexit. A crash that would be a disaster for Wales and for the UK. This is not about Brexit. That has been settled for now. It's about protecting people from the double threats of COVID-19 and the no-trade deal. The message that I hear in my constituency of Arvon, and indeed from all over Wales, is that governments must put aside all their bickering until the COVID crisis is over. Too many have lost lives. Too many families have been bereaved. Too many businesses are struggling to play politics with our futures. The recovery must be our collective priority. I urge the government to take this opportunity to get the best possible agreements, and that must be done by seeking an extension. Dilchavor, thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us at the No to No Deal virtual rally. Please welcome to your screens your host for the evening, Curtis Parfit Ford. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Hewell, for that really wonderful speech. Um, this is really strange, isn't it? We live in very interesting times at the moment, and I'm talking to you from my house, not from a stage. Uh, I'm not talking to you in front of a crowd of people. I'm looking into a camera from a room. 
who would have thought last year when a million people took to the streets of London twice calling for a people's vote on a Brexit deal that a few months later we would be in lockdown due to a global pandemic. This is unprecedented by, by every meaning of the word. The pandemic is the most serious health crisis in living memory. There is no doubt about that. And we initially wanted to host an event calling on the UK government to pause the transition period so that they could concentrate all of their resources on tackling this huge health issue. So uh, you can imagine we weren't really best pleased and were very surprised when on Friday, despite everything that's going on, Michael Gove announced that the UK government had decided it would not request an extension to transition period. And you may have seen today that Boris Johnson has announced that the UK's cutoff for the Brexit transition period will be July, and we must have a deal before then, according to him. This puts a no-deal Brexit back very firmly on the table, and it makes it clear that this is a preferred option for many of the decision makers in the government. This is terrifying as a result. It's putting ideology before science and masking the effects of the no-deal Brexit behind the impact that COVID-19 is already having on the UK economy. But while COVID-19 is a serious strain on the economy, the health service and the resources of the country, it's just one of the battles that we've been facing recently. Last year, millions of people took to the streets around the world as part of Extinction Rebellion and other groups to demand that decision makers start tackling the climate emergency. We've seen the stress that EU27 nationals have been put under due to the settled status scheme, with too many people being denied settled status to having lived in the UK for years and sometimes decades. And even more recently, we've seen the pain that the BME, BAME community is feeling. And we'd like to express our solidarity with people who've been taking part in Black Lives Matter demonstrations. With so much that's going on, it doesn't make sense to add a note of Brexit to the challenges we'll be facing in the next 12 months, especially as it's something that is within our control and completely avoidable. Our government is choosing to do this and we can choose to stop them. We have stopped a no deal before and with your help, we will do it again. We are here tonight to tell Boris Johnson and his allies in Downing Street that we say no to no deal and we are joined with some fantastic people from almost every political party that has active representation in Westminster. One of the reasons we started with a speaker from Wales is that far too often the needs of the devolved nations and of regions outside of London are overlooked by policymakers in Westminster who continue to favour ideology over people. And throughout the past four years, we've heard constantly from people of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland that their concerns of a Brexit path that was being followed by Number 10 were being overlooked. We will be hearing from a representative of Welsh, Welsh Government sorry, later, but now it's time for our next speaker. Dr Philippa Whitford is the MP for Central Ayrshire, and she is also the SNP spokesperson for Health and Social Care and for Europe. Before that, she was a breast surgeon and so has first-hand knowledge of the stresses that health service is under, even when we're not dealing with a global pandemic. So we're delighted to welcome here today, Philippa, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, I have to say when on top of my health and social care brief, I took on responsibility for Brexit, it seemed a little bit of an odd mix. But in actual fact, where we're sitting at the moment in the middle of the COVID pandemic, it absolutely reflects the situation that we're in. In 2014, we were told in Scotland that the UK was a family of nations, a family of equals. But two of those nations voted against Brexit. And those two nations have not had their voices heard or their will respected. What we have certainly experienced here in Scotland is complete disrespect. And if you ever watch BBC Parliament, then you will know how SNP MPs are treated. But on Friday, we saw Michael Gove behaving like Donald Trump and announcing by a tweet that he had already officially turned down any notion of an extension to the transition. And this was actually just a couple of hours before he was due to meet the first ministers of Wales and Scotland to discuss what the strategy should be around the transition. There is no respect. And even when meetings go ahead, which is rare enough, the UK government simply don't listen. They're not listening to those of us in the devolved nations. And frankly, they're not listening to people in England either. Businesses do not have the bandwidth to prepare even for the gentlest, easiest transition into leaving the EU. They certainly do not have the bandwidth to prepare for the double whammy of a no deal after the economic crisis that we're in. And frankly, they shouldn't have to. They shouldn't even be thinking about it. The challenge that businesses and individuals are facing at the moment is absolutely huge. 
Our society and our economy has been shaken to its very roots. We need time to take stock and look at how we rebuild. And we shouldn't be rebuilding backwards to business as usual. We should be rebuilding forwards to a greener, fairer economy, a well-being economy that looks after the physical, mental and environmental well-being of every single citizen. The COVID-19 has been an absolute mess at Westminster. We saw their ideology get in the way of taking part in EU procurement of PPE and ventilators, even though doctors and nurses in England were crying out for PPE. We know that we will miss out on the EU procurement of vaccines if the transition is not extended. As a doctor, I know the health gains that we've had from Europe over the last 40 years. Our, health our European health insurance, the research that's done collaboratively, the public health decisions, the tariff-free medicines. But more than any of those is the people, the people who have chosen to come from Europe and settle in the UK, many of them working in our health and social care sector, just like my German husband, who spent over 30 years as a GP looking after people in Scotland. He still does not yet have his citizenship sorted out. He feels rejected by this country, particularly when Theresa May talked about queue jumpers. Freedom of movement has been the biggest single benefit that we as individuals have gained. And here in Scotland, we need people. We made a perfectly reasonable proposal to have a Scottish visa to allow us to attract people to Scotland. That was turned down. I, of course, as an SNP MP, believe in independence. In 2014, I thought it would be an improvement to have the people of Scotland able to control their own future, have the decisions made by people who live here and actually care about the country. Now I see it as a necessity. And yet we have put our independence campaign aside at the moment because the COVID-19 crisis is so great. And yet we don't see that happening at Westminster. We don't see the damage of Brexit being put to one side so that not just we, but people in Europe can focus on what the real challenge is. The dog ate my homework excuse for not taking part in the ventilator procurement just doesn't cut it. It was pure ideology. And for ideology like that to be set above lives is completely wrong. In Scotland, we consider ourselves a modern, outward looking European country. We're not looking to be little Scotland. We're not looking to be inward and isolationist. As Winnie Ewing, the first ever SNP MP said, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. This is not a time to be separating people into little groups and fighting and adding more difficulties for society. This is actually a time for everyone to be focusing on what is really important, and that's lives and livelihoods. We need to say no to no deal. Thank you very much, Philippa. Um, that was a really, really excellent speech. Uh, I think we can all relate to you when you talk about the double whammy effect of COVID-19 and Brexit. I mean, we've all felt that personally in our lives, but also looking at the economy, we're in a devastating situation in which we've had a global pandemic combined with possibly one of the most important economic and social changes of the last 50 years. And coming together at the same time with no advanced planning is virtually impossible, which is why it's so important that we all write to our MPs and keep up that pressure. Make sure that we're keeping talking to our representatives and engaging with them to make sure they know the strength of feeling on this issue. There have been a lot of ongoing issues throughout the Brexit debate, but none has had quite as much attention in Parliament and everywhere else as the issues surrounding the Irish border and the Irish Sea, because they're huge issues. Brexit has revealed how complicated the overlapping and often, often interdependent issues facing the island of Ireland are. Uh, at least it's revealed it to a lot of us who are in England and Scotland and Wales who might not have previously have known about these. Obviously, the people in the communities in Northern Ireland and in Ireland already had concerns about this. 
And we're delighted to be joined today by two of those people who can talk about that with much more authenticity than I can, having had that experience themselves. The first of those is here representing the SDLP. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Matthew O'Toole, who is a member of the Northern Irish Assembly for Belfast South. Thank you very much, uh, Curtis, and uh, thank you very much for having me here um, this evening. As you said, the um, uh, Brexit has since the very beginning, since 2016, when I was still a UK government civil servant, presented unique and acute challenges for the whole island of Ireland, um, but particularly for Northern Ireland. Um, the challenge back then um, uh, was that a clique of hard right uh, Tory Brexiteers really couldn't help themselves but show their profound ignorance and indifference to the complexity and subtlety of life on the island of Ireland and how a sharp, hard Brexit would jeopardise a very subtle set of arrangements um, that really rested um, both on the Good Friday Agreement but also on the, the broader protections that EU membership on both sides of the Irish border allowed. And in some ways that problem hasn't changed today. Uh, this week, we see that those same hard right uh, Tory Brexiteers have continued with uh, a pretty sharp indifference to what happens in Northern Ireland. Others have mentioned Michael Gove's shocking decision to announce via tweet that the UK government would not be extending the transition period. This is the same Michael Gove who two weeks ago was talking about the importance of uh, Northern Ireland when the UK government published its command paper on uh, the protocol, the, the Northern Ireland protocol that is designed to um, avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. So the level of continued um, uh, and fairly grotesque indifference to what happens on the island of Ireland is, uh, is remarkable. Uh, two weeks ago, the Northern Ireland Assembly passed a motion calling for an extension to the Brexit transition period it was a motion tabled by me and my party. And what that motion said was that the Northern Ireland Assembly, which is unique among the devolved administrations in the UK, uh, in that it is a named party to the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Assembly is specifically mentioned in the withdrawal agreement. The UK government, Boris Johnson's government, insisted last autumn that the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly should be mentioned, they should have a say, that their consent should be enshrined in that document. Well, we, in a motion, um, uh, nearly a fortnight ago said that we didn't give our consent to the UK leaving without a deal at the end of um, uh, leaving without a deal at the end of uh, 2020. Well, the UK government has sing signally ignored that thus far and they've also ignored the same warnings from the Scottish government and also from the Welsh government. Uh, indeed, we, my party, uh, asked the Northern Ireland Executive today to really um, follow up with what the Northern Ireland Assembly had said and, and request a, uh, an extension. The only reason we haven't done um, is because the DUP exercised a veto and blocked that happening. My party, like other pro-European parties across these islands, was opposed to Brexit. We were opposed to Brexit because we knew it would be bad for the lives and livelihoods of everyone on these islands. And so it's proved. But Brexit has happened now. While many of us hope sincerely that Northern Ireland and indeed other parts of uh, these islands, other parts of the UK can rejoin the EU at some point, this debate we're having now isn't about rejoining the EU in the short term. This is about blocking the worst uh, of the... Um, this is about blocking the worst consequences of a new trade deal Brexit at the end of this year, which would add compound damage to businesses and workers across these islands. We simply cannot afford to crash out of the transition period without an extension at the end of this year. The fact that we are even debating this is really a grotesque indictment of the cabal that now occupies number 10. They have successfully shifted the Overton window towards something that would have been genuinely unthinkable just uh, a year or two ago. Dominic Cummings, whose shamelessness was exposed by his refusal to uh, resign uh, when he flagrantly breached, breached public health uh, regulations during the COVID-19 crisis, was demonstrated is a 
clearly the ideologue at the centre of a, uh, a plot to force the hardest possible Brexit on the people of the United Kingdom, indeed all the people of these islands. That's why it's extraordinarily important that we don't allow that cabal in number 10 to dictate the pace of the debate over the next few months. It's right that Boris Johnson said today that uh, he saw he thought the deadline for talks would be July. Well, that doesn't have to be the case. And it, though Michael Gove, in his slippery Uriah Heap way, said that the UK wouldn't be seeking an extension at the end of the, at the end of last week, we'll see what happens over the next few weeks and months. We'll see if uh, it continues to be a viable argument that the UK will crash out. I'm not sure that it will. I think whenever businesses find their voice, whenever trade unions and other bits of civic society and other opposition parties find their voice, they won't accept this uh, crashing out at the end of this year, which would be particularly damaging to the people of Northern Ireland, whom I represent. So I would say to everyone who's watching uh, this rally tonight, use your voice, write to your MP, or indeed, if you live in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, write to your MSP, your AM or your MLA and demand that they uh, don't allow this to happen, that they stand up and demand an extension to the transition. Because as we deal with this public health crisis and what could be, frankly, the biggest recession or depression in recorded economic history, we simply can't allow a crash out at the end of this year. So I hope everyone who's listening to this uses their voice and demands that their representatives demand an extension to the transition. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, as you quite rightly pointed out, it's not just in the Assembly and in Parliament that these voices are being heard, but it's all over the country, all over all sorts of uh, devolved assemblies. Um, and of course, it's really important that people who are in devolved areas not only write to their devolved representatives, but also to their MPs and vice versa. Um, and kind of on that note, uh, we've also got Northern Irish MPs cha regularly challenging a Prime Minister directly in the House of Commons. Uh, so please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming our next speaker, who is Stephen Farry, the MP for North Down and Deputy Leader of the Alliance Party for Northern Ireland. Hello, I'm Stephen Farry, the MP for North Down and the Deputy Leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland. We're only 200 days away from a huge cliff edge in the UK's relationship with the European Union. Securing a comprehensive future relationship agreement by the end of the year was always going to be very ambitious, indeed unrealistic. But now in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is utterly reckless. The UK is stepping back from its closest and biggest market. All forms of Brexit are set to bring economic damage. But the greater the diversions, the greater that damage. And the absence of any comprehensive trade deal at all will be even more problematic. So the UK was already facing up to a major economic shock at the end of this year, before the COVID crisis came along. And COVID is now going to cause a deep and potentially persistent recession for the UK. Our forecasts are showing that the UK is set to suffer more deeply than many others. So government needs to place its full focus on addressing the COVID-19 public health challenges and rebuilding the economy, not enabling further stress. Businesses and other stakeholders do not have the time and capacity to cover these challenges as well as planning for a still uncertain Brexit outcome. They all only have so much bandwidth. But Brexit and the implications of no future relationship at the end of the year stretch well beyond economics. Their implications for policing, security, human rights, freedom of movement and access to EU programmes. Indeed, there's a deep irony that we're rightly expressing gratitude to the NHS and all its staff for their service throughout this crisis. Yet, a no deal Brexit would undermine its work and hinder the future recruitment of workers. Now, some may argue that a no deal outcome would present less of a risk to Northern Ireland, given that we have the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol and will have an ongoing relationship with the European Union. But it does present some very particular challenges to us too. The protocol is a sad and inevitable outworking of the UK government's decision to seek a hard Brexit and the resultant and vital need to protect the Good Friday Agreement. Northern Ireland only works on the basis of sharing and interdependence, and any new barriers or friction bring difficulties. Under the protocol, checks cannot be avoided entirely. However, Within the rules of the withdrawal agreement, we are committed to doing all we can to mitigate its impact. 
Yet, the more distant the relationship between the UK and EU, the greater the requirement for checks and bureaucracy on that Irish Sea interface. This is particularly the case if no future relationship is agreed at the, at the end of the year. Such an outcome may well have considerable political and economic implications for Northern Ireland. Overall, there is an obvious suspicion that the UK government is determined to, to proceed with the current timescale in order to mask the economic damage of Brexit within the wider economic turbulence arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. I have been challenging the Prime Minister on the need for this extension and working alongside representatives of many other parties and civil society to make this case. The clock is ticking, but we will not be relenting. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I've been an activist in Ealing in, in West London for uh, a number of years now, and even though I was personally too young to vote in 2016, and even though I live in London, Northern Ireland is a topic that's come up in conversation on a lot of occasions. So obviously, it's of such significance and importance to everything surrounding what's going on with Brexit at the moment. Obviously, at the start of the event, we saw a video from Pierce, a, a young activist from Northern Ireland, and activism is at the heart of everything that happens politically, naturally. It's thanks to people giving their time to campaign for what they believe in, but we managed to put a million people on the streets of London twice during people's vote campaign. That's something absolutely amazing, and it's a testament to all of our activists that we've been able to do something like that. It's also thanks to people giving up their time that we've successfully achieved numerous extensions to our time as a member of the European Union and prevented no deal before. We've been here before a number of times and we've managed it thanks to our amazing network of activists. That time should have been spent by the government either deciding which path it wanted to take with Brexit or on giving us a public vote so we could decide for our, uh, so we, that we could decide for them rather. But we once again find ourselves facing a no deal Brexit that's solely based on ideology. There is no reason for doing this. However, just like before, it's through activism, activism that we will continue to fight the no deal Brexit in all of the nations and regions of the UK. And to that end, I'd like to now hand over to Susanna, who is an activist from a local group in Perth in Scotland, who has a few words for you. Hello, my name is Susanna Ray and I'm an active member of Perth for Europe and the European Movement in Scotland. I'm slightly less active at the moment because we're in lockdown because of coronavirus. And it's because of coronavirus and its impacts that I was very disappointed when Michael Gove announced that there would be no extension to the transition period. This increases the risk of no deal. And even if there is a deal, it doesn't give businesses time to prepare for it because they don't know what the rules are going to be. And by putting businesses at risk, they're putting our jobs at risk. And people are already struggling as a result of coronavirus. We really don't need another stress on the economy, another set of job losses simply because this government is not being responsible towards its population. Now, the Scottish government has asked for an extension to the transition period. The Welsh government has asked for one, and the Northern Ireland Assembly has asked for one. And that's all the devolved nations are asking the UK government to extend the transition period. This is not about avoiding Brexit. Brexit has happened. We've left the EU. The devolved nations are asking for an extension so that we can say no to no deal, so that we can have an orderly Brexit and protect people's jobs and protect the economy. And I very much hope that the UK government will listen to this. Thank you very much, Susanna. And we'll hear a little bit more from uh, Susanna and some other local activists at the end of the event. Our next speaker is a Labour MP who has been incredibly supportive of our calls, both on social media and during debates in the House of Commons. This is a cross-party movement and we want to get everybody involved as much as possible. Recently, he's joined other Labour figures, including Sadiq Khan, Mark Drayford, the First Minister for Wales, and the Scottish Labour Party in speaking out publicly in support of a pause to the transition so that we can prevent an ideal Brexit and the chaos that would ensue. Please welcome the Labour and Cooperative MP for Swansea West, Geraint Davies. Good evening. We meet in lockdown from a virus that has claimed 42,000 deaths, the highest level in Europe, with just six months of the transition period left with no deal negotiated, needing a deal that will continue uh, the exports of 44% of our trade, 60% from, from Wales, uh, and hear from a government who refused an extension despite the appeals from the Welsh government, the Scottish government, and offers from the EU. No one would have thought that we would be facing a one in a hundred year pandemic that's claimed so many thousands of lives. 
quite naturally, the focus of government has shifted to save lives rather than negotiation. Yet we have got to now establish a deal that sets in train a re-engineering of our economy and sets the template for decades to come. In 2016, people were promised more money, more jobs, more control. I don't think they got it and they should have had a vote on the deal. But now in 2019, we were promised get Brexit done, an oven ready Brexit, but we haven't got an oven ready Brexit. Instead, we face the prospect of a possible bad deal or a no deal Brexit. The CBI have said um, that our recovery could be blocked, could be in jeopardy, there'll be greater inequalities. COVID has already given rise to a 20% reduction in our economy. There could be a further four to 6% on top of that, the British Retail Consortium has said there could be shortages in food supplies. Like seventy percent of our fresh food comes in from Europe in January, for example. The Japanese car manufacturers have said uh, they may pull up sticks. As Nissan has said, if uh, there's tariffs, then what's the point of being in Britain when they were here in the first place to trade into the EU market? There's an EU Japanese trade deal. Uh, they may as well relocate. And there's fundamental differences between the UK and the EU in terms of negotiations on fisheries, on governance, on a level playing field. Meanwhile, on the side, uh, the US trade deal is, is threatening to undermine the EU deal, which is 60 times bigger, because the US seems to want to, uh, for us to import substandard foods and chemicals that would be prohibited in uh, the EU. The UK standards are not a bargaining chip. They should be a blueprint for our standards, for our values, a blueprint for the future, for our economy, for climate change, for environmental protection, for workers' rights, for our NHS, for our public services, for our food safety, for sustainable fishing. We need to change our domestic legislation to ensure that these values are instilled in them ahead uh, and within the trade agreement. So the agriculture bill needs to embrace our food standards. The environment bill needs to have a non-regression clause so we don't slip below EU standards but rise above it. The trade bill needs to ensure parliamentary scrutiny. None of these things have been provided uh, so far. We uh, need a situation where we face the future together. The challenges of the world in terms of whether it's public health, whether it's security, whether it's prosperity or poverty, whether it's environmental sustainability. We need to hold hands, move together in an uncertain world. We do not want a situation of chaos, of a broken economy, of a divided kingdom, of a second COVID peak. So we must work together with Europe, pull together for a shared future, for a prosperous future where we share each other's values in friendship together. I say and we say no to no deal, yes to a strong Britain in a strong Europe, in a strong world working together for all our futures. Thank you, Dale Kamal. Thank you very much, Garrett, and thank you also for your support of the campaign. Um, as we've talked about previously, and I know this kind of comes up and comes up and comes up, but it is so important that we get more activists involved, as many people as possible, because this campaign really is powered by local activists. Regardless of where you are in the UK, there will be a local group near you, and we encourage you to go to europeanmovement.co.uk and find your local group and get involved. It's really, really important, and thank you so much to all the local activists who've already done so. The European Movement has 126 local groups in the four corners of the country, and we also work in partnership with other organisations organizations who share our goals. One of those organizations is Wales for Europe and they've recorded this video for you. So I'm speaking on behalf of Wales for Europe this evening representing activists from across Wales and we all knew that 2020 wasn't going to be easy for our campaign but I don't think any of us could have predicted quite how difficult it's been. But we're still here and we're still active. And on the night of the 31st of January this year, the night the UK officially left the EU, we held a vigil for peace in Europe in Cardiff. And we said then, there's still work to be done. It's just different now. 
And as we move into another crucial phase in our campaign, let's make sure that we don't allow ourselves to be drawn back into old arguments and old slogans. Let's make sure that we campaign based on where we are now and what we need now. Because Boris Johnson and his government, they are ignoring the current reality of the situation that we face in order to deliver on a slogan. They're ignoring the repeated calls for an extension to the transition period from the Welsh Government, the Scottish Government and the Government in Northern Ireland. And we all know that no deal will be disastrous. But saying no to no deal is not enough. Avoiding no deal narrowly is not enough. Because we don't just want any old deal. What we want and what we need is a deal that's right for Wales and the UK now, as we face Covid. A bare bones deal that allows for the erosion of protections, rights and standards over time. Well, that's not good enough. And a deal that piles further hardship on top of the suffering caused by Covid, that's not good enough either. What we want and what we need is a relationship with the EU that supports our NHS, our farmers, our businesses, our universities, our port towns and jobs across the board. And I've always said that this whole campaign was never just about the customs union or this or that piece of regulation. It was always about the kind of country and the kind of world we want to live in and the kind of future that we want to build. And if there was ever a time to stand up for that, it's now. So let's keep on going, let's keep on campaigning, let's keep on with the work. Diolch yn fawr ac ymlaen. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, at the start of this rally, we told you that the Welsh Government had endorsed this event and our campaign to say no to no deal, and they have. And uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to join us live tonight, like many of our other speakers are, um, but they have recorded a message uh, which we would like to play for you now. Hello, I'm Elaine Ed Morgan. I'm Minister for International Relations in the Welsh Government. I represent the constituency of Mid and West Wales for the Labour Party. I just want to make it absolutely clear that the Welsh Government wants to see an extension to the transition period because we believe that a crash out, no deal Brexit will be catastrophic for Britain, but in particular for Wales. 60% of our trade in goods is with the European Union. It's about 48% for the rest of the UK. So we know that we'll be hit harder if there is a no deal Brexit. We'll be particularly hit hard in our automotive sector and our agricultural sector, which makes up a huge amount of the jobs that are uh, produced in Wales. What's clear to me is that the UK government made promises. The Tories said that these would be easy deals to negotiate. Well, that has not been the case. We've all accepted now that we have left the European Union, but that doesn't mean to say that in the midst of this incredible catastrophe that we're facing with the COVID-19 virus, that we pile problem upon problem. We need to see an extension to that transition period and we need to do absolutely everything we can to avoid a no deal Brexit. Thank you, Elena, and thank you indeed to everybody at the Welsh Government for their support of our campaign. The First Minister has, I know, been very vocal in his calls to prevent the no deal Brexit, um, seeing as it is how very, very dangerous it is for all of us. Politicians, businesses and ordinary people from all four nations have called on the government to say no to no deal. In many cases saying that they just don't have time to prepare for one now after so many promises made since 2016 and it shouldn't be a priority when we've got COVID-19 to deal with. Once again, we return to Northern Ireland now, which as Stephen Farrow from the Alliance Party said earlier, will be badly hit by no deal Brexit. Uh, but we're also pleased to have the leader of the SLP here uh, to have a, have a chat. So please now welcome Colin Eastwood MP for Foyle and party leader of the Social Democratic and Labour Party of Northern Ireland. Given all that we've been facing with uh, coronavirus, it seems absolutely nonsensical for Boris Johnson and this British government to keep uh, moving towards uh, a no deal, a no trade deal uh, at the end of this year, because that is what inevitably will happen. 
if he refuses to support an extension to the Brexit transition period. And that will be absolutely catastrophic uh, for our businesses, for our workers, for our communities, for our environmental standards, and for all of those things that we understand the European Union have been very helpful to us uh, with. So, I mean, the, the, I think Boris Johnson is working on the basis that we will hit a recession uh, and people won't know the difference as to whether it was COVID-19 or a bad Brexit that has caused it. It is the most reckless uh, government that we have ever seen and it is, uh, they are absolutely destroying uh, the opportunity for economic prosperity and for protecting the most vulnerable in our society. So we would ask them uh, to think again, to ask for a proper extension, to get a Brexit deal that doesn't put the economy uh, in the toilet and that protects uh, the rights of our citizens here. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, in recent years, the Conservative Party has moved in a more Eurosceptic direction, uh, shall we say. Um, I think that should be fairly evident to everybody, but uh, this wasn't always the case, it's important to remember. And we regularly hear from Conservative Party members and indeed Conservative MPs who tell us that while they feel a sense of loyalty to the party, they almost don't recognise that as the party that they've joined. Our next speaker put his head above the parapet last year when he said that despite being one of its most famous members, he was unable to support the Conservative Party at the European elections due to its continued flirting with a no-deal Brexit. Standing up for what he believed in meant that he had the party whip removed from him after more than 65 years of loyal support. But that hasn't deterred him, and he continues to show support for campaigns that he believes in, including our one. Please join me in welcoming the President of the European Movement and the former Deputy Prime Minister of the UK, Lord Michael Heseltine. Everybody knows that the battle for Brexit was deeply felt and uh, uh, of historic proportions. And those of us who fought to remain within the European Union have to accept that the British people took a decision democratically, clearly in favour of severing that relationship. I believe they were wrong. I believe that uh, the matter will come up for further review and that one day we will rejoin the neighbours in Europe. But that decision is no longer on the political table. We've moved on. We have effectively taken the decision to leave and implemented it. But of course, that is oversimplifying the situation. We haven't actually left uh, in practical terms. That's why we have a transitional period to work out the details, to try and find solutions, to reduce to the minimum the damaging effects. Now you have to throw into this the coronavirus tragedy. No one could have seen it coming. And it's not for me uh, to do anything other than recognize the government has done what it believes to be best to try and cope. And things are getting better, and that is excellent news. But the coincidence of these two events is potentially disastrous for our economy. Every statistic that is published shows how much damage is being done. And uh, to inject the uncertainty of a no deal at the end of this calendar year into the chaos of the coronavirus epidemic is, in my view, grossly irresponsible. Now, of course, I understand those who believe in Brexit, who will say, oh, yes, you're just a lot of Remainers trying to have another go. Uh, I don't believe that. We are simply facing the reality which no one could have foreseen. And I think that a government should be big enough to recognize it has secured its objective, but to do everything practical to make that objective work in the national interest. And if that means changing the date on which the transitional period ends, so be it. It would be quite wrong to try and make capital out of such a review of uh, the timetable. I believe the government has a responsibility now 
to put at the top of its agenda the best possible deal, not the worst possible outcome, which is a no deal. Thank you very much, Lord Hasselton. There are many people from the Conservative Party, including serving MPs, who feel exactly the same about no deal Brexit. And if you're represented by a Conservative MP or indeed an MP from any party, please write to them and encourage them to stand up for the people of this country by saying no to no deal Brexit. I know it sometimes seems difficult. I know it sometimes seems like they don't listen. Please continue to write, continue to keep the pressure up, write to your local newspaper. Keep putting that pressure in because that's what's important and that's what changes things. We only have two more political speakers remaining, but they're both people you'll be very excited to hear from. First up, I would like to welcome Amelia Womack, who is Deputy Leader of the Green Party. Amelia, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. And it's so brilliant to have so many of you here today and just showing that we can still come together, even though we need to be physically apart. In the decision to rule out an extension to the transition period made me angry, scared, and quite honest, quite confused. Why would the government do such an obviously reckless and self-defeating thing at a time of national crisis? I've spent time thinking about it and I think there are three possible reasons. The first is that ministers think that the impact of coronavirus dwarfs any possible impact of no deal Brexit. In reality, the opposite is true. The impact of coronavirus raises the stakes of a no deal Brexit. The crisis has shown how fragile our just in time supply chains are and how poorly prepared our underfunded public sector is to respond to these kinds of emergencies. With the second wave of the pandemic possibly arriving in the winter, the last thing we need is a secondary shock of a no deal Brexit at exactly the same time. Ministers are right to be worried about the worst recession in 300 years. They're wrong to think that it means a no deal doesn't matter. The second reason the government might have done this is that they're clinging on to an ideology that won them the general election, but has turned to sand in their fingertips during a global pandemic, getting Brexit done. In November, this slogan was fairy dust, and now it looks more like magic beans. For the likes of Johnson and Cummings, the one promise they made to the country must feel like the only solid thing they can grasp as the world around them collapses. But it's never been more dangerous to play in the gallery of nativ nativism. And the last thing we need is a government ideologically opposed to international institutions when we need to pull together now more than ever. The third reason, and possibly the most important reason, and one we must not forget, is no deal was plan A for a lot of Brexiteers. The reason these talks are currently collapsing is because Britain won't accept a level playing field. What does that mean? It means upholding workers' rights. It means upholding environmental protections. It means all the things which stand in the way of a race to the bottom trade deal with the US. For free market fundamentalists, no deal was always the prize. And this is what we have always come together as a movement to oppose. Now we must fight harder than ever. Whatever the reason, we're facing down the barrel of a no deal at the end of the year, and it's clear that we must resist together. The government is woefully out of step with the public on Brexit. Over two thirds of people want to pause Brexit, including a huge number of Conservatives and Leave voters. The public are pragmatic where our government is fanatic. We know it just makes sense to extend the talks during a global pandemic so that we can arrive at the best possible deal. Instead, our government wants to throw fuel on the fire of this crisis. It's disaster capitalism at its most disgusting. And it's up for us to yank the steering wheel from Boris Johnson and steer us away from this cliff edge. Campaigning changes things. Grassroots campaigners like the ones you've heard from today can work to change the path of history. I want to thank them for all of their work, but also say that you can make a difference too. Write to your MP, write to your local papers, tell them why you say no to no deal and why you want to pause the pause of Brexit. 
Never forget your own power. And maybe your email can tip the balance of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia. That was amazing. And yes, you are absolutely right. Emails, letters, phone calls, everything, that genuinely can make such a huge difference. I'd like to introduce you next to Hugo Mann. Hugo Mann is the CEO of the European Movement. And before joining us in 2017, he spent several years in the campaign team of Conservative Party. I've worked with him for a long time and he's absolutely wonderful. He's gonna talk about why we organized this event and about our campaign to stop an no Brexit before we move on to our next speakers. So without further ado, Hugo. Cheers, Curtis. Uh, and I'll keep my uh, remarks really quick because I know we've got um, some amazing speakers and, and uh, a few more videos left. So I don't want to get in the way, particularly because I know a lot of you um, see me enough as it is. Uh, so I just want to say, first of all, uh, a massive thank you to uh, Scott Daniels, uh, Curtis and the whole European Movement team for putting on this event this evening. I think it's been amazing. Uh, two weeks ago, this was merely a pipe dream, which we were thinking, should we do this? Are we going to have enough time? Um, but I think, as you can see, um, the quality of the speakers we've had this evening and indeed the event as a whole has gone uh, amazingly well. So I just want to say once again, thank you. And thank you all for joining um, uh, this evening and to our speakers, which have been incredible. I just want to say a few words about what the European movement has been doing over the last couple of months. I think it's pretty uh, self-evident. We've been campaigning hard to try uh, you know, and secure that ext uh, um, extension to try and put a pause uh, in place. Um, for all the reasons you've heard uh, this evening, and I won't go over them. Um, I, I won't go over them again, because you know what they are. But in terms of what we've been doing, um, I mean, we've got 126 groups around the country, which you know, I think Curtis already mentioned too, and lots of them have been writing fanatically to their uh, MPs, been writing into uh, their local newspapers. They've also been talking to local businesses and other important stakeholders like farmers and health workers, getting them on board as well to really say, come on, we need to really make the case now that we need to have an extension and we need to avoid a no deal as it will be catastrophic given what has been happening over the last uh, couple of months with the pandemic. So that's really been the sort of the bread and butter um, of our uh, campaign. Um, you appreciate that in this sort of new normal, we haven't been able to do traditional sorts of campaigning like street stalls, like locking on doors and handing out leaflets and, and petitions in the flesh. So this has all been done by our groups um, really uh, behind uh, the uh, you know behind the behind the computer really and given where we are, we've also got a petition online which has got sixty thousand signatures, uh, which has gone remarkably well. So if you haven't signed our petition, please please do. Um, we've also got an online letter writing tool uh, which has now sort of got just over ten thousand um, online letters have been sent to MPs all around uh, the country making uh, the uh, ma making the case for extension. Obviously, with what uh, has happened uh, with uh, Michael Gove, obviously, his tweets last week saying the government wouldn't be seeking an extension, uh, it does make the message slightly different. And obviously, now we obviously have to say there is still time to obviously pause and have, and have that extension. Um, but also, um, it's also, I think, we, we have to now spell out why no deal is going to be catastrophic. So as you've heard this evening, if you're listening to this, and you'll think about how you can get involved, you know, with the European movement, with this campaign. Write to your MP, write to your local newspaper. It's really effective. The local MP reads the local newspaper. Um, they want to know what's going on. So please, please, please write to your local newspaper, write to your MP, you know, chip into our crowdfunder as well, which has made over £70,000. Uh, so thank you to everybody who's donated. We do have time and, you know, the fight is still going on. So we need you now more than ever. So please join your local group as well. Go onto our website, check it out. There will be a local group near you. And uh, I think, you know, if we can really get that groundswell going, you know, as, you know, as we've heard tonight, we can make a difference. So thanks very much for your hard work and let's keep going. Thank you very much, Hugo. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of politicians with us tonight, and nobody knows the power of the activism that you've been talking about, and we've been talking about all, all tonight, than those politicians who are actually receiving those messages and interacting with their constituents in that way. And so uh, I'd like to introduce you to our final political speaker, who is Leila Moran, who is the uh, MP for Oxford West and Abingdon. Leila.
Apologies, Layla, I think something's gone a bit wrong there. We can't quite hear you. Um, can we try, if you click on the bottom of your screen, there should be a mute button. Can we try that? Hello, can you hear there me now? There we are, that's better. Wonderful. Yes, thank you, Layla. Thank you so much. Well, I'll start again. Firstly, with a massive thanks to the organizers and thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Your energy and your heart really fire us up to keep fighting. I can't believe we're here again. I remember in April 2018 launching the People's Vote with Caroline and Anna and Chuka, and we knew then that the key to this was cross-party working. And we also knew that your activism was also key to changing hearts and minds out there in the country. Now, of course, politics has changed a lot between now and then, but one principle remains. We need you. Grassroots activism can make an amazing difference. So thank you for organizing this evening. And I have one main message for everyone tonight. It's not too late to do things differently. Crashing out without a deal on the 31st of December is not set in stone. We can still urge the government to change its mind and stop this monumentally self-destructive act in its tracks. It is not too late for us to work together across party lines to compel the government to request an extension to the transition period. And as many have pointed out tonight, the reason why we have to do this is because we are not through coronavirus yet. We may yet face a second wave, and ministers need to focus on the crisis in front of them, not create another. And this matters because it's people's lives that we are talking about here. It's not like they are doing a great job on coronavirus to begin with. And on that, we need an independent inquiry now so that we can avoid the mistakes that have already been made should we hit a second wave in the autumn. But the mismanagement of COVID results in deaths, yes, but so does mismanagement of the economy. Because if you lift our eyes to the political realities we find ourselves in, we are potentially in the middle of a one in 300 year economic event. Unemployment levels not seen since the 80s are predicted. The economy is not just going to be down, it's in free fall. And careering off the cliff edge of no deal is a kick in its teeth at a time when it's on its knees. This can and must be avoided. And the thing is, people can see this out there. They see the logic. They can see the damage that this would do. And that is why there is growing public support for an extension. My job as an MP is to act in the very best interests of my constituents. But I want it on that record that I believe that an extension has to be the right way forward. And so I'm working cross-party with Labour backbenchers, Greens, SMP, Plaid Cymru MPs. We've drafted a bill that could pull us back from the brink. We have to represent the best interests of the entire country as well as our constituents, and we have to convince Boris Johnson of it. And this isn't about forcing anyone into a corner or embarrassing anyone. Political games or fighting fire with fire will not help. But constructive cross-party working might. MPs owning the call and the decision might be the right answer. Because it will make it easier for the government to point the finger at MPs when Nigel Farage then picks up his phone and has a tantrum, albeit not on LBC anymore, thank goodness. So to politicians across the commons who might be listening, and especially the leader of the opposition, I say, let's send Boris Johnson a clear and simple message. It's not too late. To activists out there, you know how to do this. I've seen you do it. I've done it with you. Write to your MP. Attend rallies, virtual or not. Your energy matters. Your voices do and can change minds. And to Boris Johnson, I say, take this branch that's being offered to you. Put the power to call for that extension in the hands of the people's representatives. Work with us to do the right thing for the people of this country who have suffered enough this year. Because businesses in crisis from COVID 
can't move forward under the threat of no deal. People already worried for their future can't move forward if they lose their jobs because of no deal. Our health services can't move forward if resources are being removed to prepare for no deal. So why on earth would we increase the chances of no deal? Prime Minister, you can avoid these disastrous consequences for our country by listening. Heed the warnings of your constituents and do the right thing. Thank you all for being here. Don't give up. Together, we will not stop fighting for what is right for our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. And thank you to everybody who's been attending tonight, albeit virtually. This evening, you've heard from speakers from every corner of the UK, and they come from different communities, different political persuasions. We've had people on this stream from people from all sorts of different political parties from across the UK. But they are all united in the belief that a no-deal Brexit would be a disaster for our economy, for our NHS, and for our country. This isn't about whether you voted leave, whether you voted remain, whether you didn't vote, or whether, like me, you were too young to vote in 2016. It's about doing what's in the national interest now, when we are in the middle of the biggest public health crisis in over a century. We have been so, so grateful for the support that we've received so far. And thanks to you, we've been able to host events like this, which enable our message to be heard by thousands of people. By giving us the resources that we need to invest in remote and digital methods of lobbying while we can't meet in person, you've helped us launch a tool that's enabled over 10,000 people to write to their MP. And it's made sure that European movement branches and communities across the UK have the resources that we need to take our activism online. If you're able to, please make a donation to our crowdfunder today so we can keep doing this and we can keep being more effective. Remember to keep writing to your MPs, keep signing petitions, bother your newspapers, get people involved much more broadly. These are the important things that you can do to change the future of this country. And together, I believe, and I need you to believe, that we can stop a no-deal Brexit. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.